Today is day three for the Come Follow Me study for this week, January 8th through the 14th. I will go and do. First Nephi, 1 through 5. Wednesday, January 10th, 2024. First Nephi 3, 1 through 8. Chapter 3. Lehi's sons return to Jerusalem to obtain the plates of brass. Laban refuses to give the plates up. Nephi exhorts and encourages his brethren. Laban steals their property and attempts to slay them. Laman and Lemuel smite Nephi and Sam and are reproved by an angel, about 600 to 592 B.C. Nephi responds to the Lord's command. 1 Nephi 3, 1-3 And it came to pass that I, Nephi, returned from speaking with the Lord to the tent of my father. And it came to pass that he spake unto me, saying, Behold, I have dreamed a dream, in the which the Lord hath commanded me that thou and thy brethren shall return to Jerusalem. For behold, Laban hath the record of the Jews, and also a genealogy of my forefathers, and they are engraven upon plates of brass. Brother Hugh Nibley said, The purpose of the plates, as he saw it, was to preserve the crucial heritage of the past for generations to come, and especially to retain intact the unbroken religious tradition of God's people back to the very beginning. This is the announcement that launches the vast and restless record-keeping project of Lehi's descendants determined to keep intact the chain of writings that bound them to the righteous of every age in a single unbroken faith and tradition. For the ancients, all history was sacred history. First Nephi 3, 4. Wherefore the Lord hath commanded me that thou and thy brothers should go unto the house of Laban and seek the records and bring them down hither into the wilderness. And as a reminder, the distance from Jerusalem to the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, is about 180 miles through hot, barren country infested anciently by many marauders. Lehi and his family traveled three days' journey beyond this point. This meant at least a 12 to 14 day trip one way, which gives added meaning to Lehi's response in 1 Nephi 3 7. 1 Nephi 3 5 And now behold, thy brothers murmur, saying, It is a hard thing which I have required of them. But behold, I have not required it of them. But it is a commandment of the Lord. When the Lord commands Lehi's sons to obtain the plates of brass, he did not give specific instructions on how to do it. This is often true of direction we receive from God, and it might feel like he has required a hard thing. 1 Nephi 3, 6-7 Therefore go, my son, and thou shalt be favored of the Lord, because thou hast not murmured. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he hath commanded them. You and your children might enjoy role-playing, 1 Nephi 3, 2-7. Maybe you could pretend to be Lehi and ask your children to return to Jerusalem to get the brass plates. Invite them to respond in their own words, as if they were Laman and Lemuel or Nephi. What are some things God has commanded us to do? How can we be like Nephi? President Heber J. Grant said, I am thankful beyond expression that I did read the Book of Mormon in my boyhood days, and that the assurance came into my heart that it was in very deed the truth, and that I fell in love with the character of Nephi. More than any other mortal man that we have any record of in the Bible, the Old or the New Testaments, or in the Book of Mormon, more, I believe, than the influence of my friends and associates with whom I have lived, Nephi has made an impression upon my heart and my soul and has been one of the guiding stars of my life, a man who endeavored upon all occasions never to become discouraged or disheartened, never to complain, but who endeavored to the full extent of his ability to carry out his own wonderful words spoken to his father. I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. That remarkable declaration, exemplified through his entire life, has stayed with me, I am sure, now for fully fifty long years, and I rejoice in the fact of the impression that was made upon my heart and soul by that statement. I also rejoice in his immediately exemplifying the statement that he would do what the Lord required. What had the Lord required? The Lord, through Lehi his father, had received a dream to the effect that his sons were to return to Jerusalem, 
and secure the brass plates upon which some of the ancient scriptures and the genealogy of the forefathers of Lehi were recorded, and his brethren were complaining, when he made that impressive announcement that he would go and do the thing which the Lord had required. Elder Mary and G. Romney said, I believe with all my heart, for example, that if our young people would come out of our homes thoroughly acquainted with the life of Nephi, imbued with the spirit of his courage and love of truth, they would choose the right when a choice is placed before them. How marvelous it would be if, when they must make a decision, there would flash into their minds from long and intimate association with them the words of Nephi, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. Bishop Robert L. Simpson said, My brothers and sisters, true greatness has a habit of surviving the years. I am certain that every member of the church has thrilled at the words of a stalwart young man of ironic priesthood age who lived approximately 2,600 years ago. When faced with a difficult situation, he said, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. This young man, destined to become a great prophet, had a most important quality. He had courage, courage to stand on his own two feet rather than follow the so-called easier way, the more popular way, the beckoning of the crowd, in this case, his own brothers. President Spencer W. Kimball said, When my feelings of incompetence wholly overwhelmed me, I remembered the words of Nephi. I want to tell you that I lean heavily on these promises that the Lord will strengthen and give me growth and fit and qualify me for this great work. I have seen the Lord qualify men. In my church experience, I have helped to call many bishops. I have seen them grow and prosper and become great and mighty men in the church, men who were weak and men who were foolish, and they become strong and confounded the wise. And so I rely upon that promise of the Lord that he will strengthen and empower me, that I may be able to do this work, to which I have been called. Commenting on 1 Nephi 3.7, Elder Russell M. Nelson taught, I have learned not to put question marks, but to use exclamation points when calls are issued through inspired channels of priesthood government. Elder Donald L. Stahili of the 70 quoted President Ezra Taft Benson in order to teach about the power that comes through obedience. Regardless of our age and stage in life, Daily obedience to gospel principles is the only sure way to eternal happiness. President Ezra Taft Benson put it most poignantly when he said, When obedience ceases to be an irritant and becomes our quest, in that moment God will endow us with power. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency acknowledged the need for prayer and faith to obey the Lord's commandments. Whoever we are, however difficult our circumstances, we can know that what our Father commands, we do to qualify for the blessings of eternal life, will not be beyond us. We may have to pray with faith to know what we are to do, and we must pray with a determination to obey. But we can know what to do, and be sure that the way has been prepared for us by the Lord. Joseph Smith said, As my life consisted of activity and unyielding exertions, I made this my rule. When the Lord commands, I do it. Under Boyd K. Packer said, It is in the way we answer the call that we show the measure of our devotion. Never say no to an opportunity to serve in the church. If you are called to an assignment by one who has authority, there is but one answer. It is, of course, expected that you set forth clearly what your circumstances are, but any assignment that comes under call from your bishop or your stake president is a call that comes from the Lord. An article of our faith, number five, determines it so and I bear witness that it is so. Once called to such positions, do not presume to set your own date of release. A release is, in effect, another call. Men do not call themselves to offices in the church. Why must we presume that we have the authority to release ourselves? A release should come by the same authority from whence came the call. Act in the office to which you are called with all diligence. Do not be a slothful servant. Be punctual and dependable and faithful. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, then of the First Presidency, explained, Following the Savior will not remove all of your trials. However, it will remove the barriers between you and the help your Heavenly Father wants to give you. God will be with you. Where do I start if I am struggling to keep multiple commandments? 
President Harold B. Lee taught, the most important of all the commandments of God is that one that you are having the most difficulty keeping today. Put that aright, and then you start on the next one that is most difficult for you to keep. That's the way to sanctify yourself by keeping the commandments of God. Why does Heavenly Father give us commandments? God helps answers this question in Doctrine and Covenants 82, 8 through 9. And again I say unto you, I give unto you a new commandment, that you may understand my will concerning you. Or, in other words, I give unto you directions how you may act before me, that it may turn to you for your salvation. Sister Carol M. Stevens, formerly of the Relief Society General Presidency, explained, As we allow our Father to teach us, we will begin to see that His laws are a manifestation of His love for us and obedience to his laws is an expression of our love for him. What can we learn from the life of Jesus Christ about obedience? Watch the video Obedience Brings Blessings to hear what President Thomas S. Monson taught about obedience. What a glorious promise! He that keepeth God's commandments receiveth truth and light, till he's glorified in truth and knoweth all things. My brothers and sisters, the great test of this life is obedience. We will prove them herewith, saith the Lord, to see if they will do all things, whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them, declared the Savior, for all who will have a blessing at my hands shall abide the law which was appointed for that blessing and the conditions thereof as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. No greater example of obedience exists than that of our Savior. Of him, Paul observed, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. The Savior demonstrated genuine love of God by living the perfect life, by honoring the sacred mission that was his. Never was he haughty, never was he puffed up with pride, never was he disloyal, never was he humble, Ever was he sincere, ever was he obedient. When faced with the agony of Gethsemane, where he endured such pain that his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground, he exemplified the obedient son by saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As the Savior instructed his early apostles, so he instructs you and me. Quote, follow thou me. Quote, quote. Are we willing to obey? The knowledge which we seek, the answers for which we yearn, and the strength which we desire today to meet the challenges of a complex and changing world can be ours when we willingly obey the Lord's commandments. I quote once again the words of the Lord. He that keepeth God's commandments receiveth truth and light until he's glorified in truth and knoweth all things. It is my humble prayer that we may be blessed with the rich rewards promised to the obedient. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. What inspires you about Nephi's response to the Lord's command in 1 Nephi 3.7? One powerful way that God has prepared us to keep His commandments is by sending Jesus Christ to be our Savior. Consider reading President Dallin H. Hoke's message, What Has Our Savior Done for Us?
In a Saturday evening meeting at a state conference many years ago, I met a woman who said her friends had asked her to come back to church after many years of inactivity, but she could not think of any reason why she should. To encourage her, I said, when you consider all of the things the Savior has done for you, you have many reasons to come back to worship and serve Him. I was astonished when she replied, What's He done for me? What has Jesus Christ done for each of us? He has done everything that is essential for our journey through mortality toward the destiny outlined in the plan of our Heavenly Father. I will speak of four of the principal features of that plan. In each of these, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, is the central figure. Motivating all of this is the love of God which setteth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men, wherefore it is the most desirable above all things. Just before Easter Sunday, it is timely to speak first of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection from the dead is the reassuring personal pillar of our faith. It adds meaning to our doctrine, motivation to our behavior, and hope for our future. Because we believe the Bible and Book of Mormon descriptions of the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ, we also accept the numerous scriptural teachings that a similar resurrection will come to all mortals who have ever lived upon this earth. As Jesus taught, because I live, ye shall live also. And his apostle taught that the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. But the resurrection gives us more than this assurance of immortality. It changes the way we view mortal life. The resurrection gives us the perspective and the strength to endure the mortal challenges faced by each of us and those we love. It gives us a new way to view the physical, mental, or emotional deficiencies we have at birth or acquire during mortal life. It gives us strength to endure sorrows, failures, and frustration. Because each of us has an assured resurrection, we know that these mortal deficiencies and oppositions are only temporary. The resurrection also gives us a powerful incentive to keep the commandments of God during our mortal lives. When we rise from the dead and proceed to our prophesied final judgment, we want to have qualified for the choicest blessings promised to resurrected beings. In addition, the promise that the resurrection can include an opportunity to be with our family members, husband, wife, children, parents, and posterity, is a powerful encouragement to fulfill our family responsibilities in mortality. It also helps us to live together in love in this life, and it comforts us in the death of our loved ones. We know that these mortal separations are only temporary and we anticipate future joyful reunions and associations. The resurrection provides us hope and the strength to be patient as we wait. It also prepares us with the courage and dignity to face our own death, even a death that might be called premature. All of these effects of the resurrection are part of the first answer to the question, what has Jesus Christ done for me? For most of us, the opportunity to be forgiven of our sins is the major meaning of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. In worship, we reverently sing, His precious blood He freely spilt, His life He freely gave, a sinless sacrifice for guilt, a dying world to save. Our Savior and Redeemer endured incomprehensible suffering to become a sacrifice for the sins of all mortals who would repent. 
This atoning sacrifice offered the ultimate good, the pure lamb without blemish, for the ultimate measure of evil, the sins of the entire world. It opened the door for each of us to be cleansed of our personal sins so we can be readmitted to the presence of God, our eternal Father. This open door is available to all of the children of God. <clears throat> In worship we sing, I marvel that he would descend from his throne divine to rescue a soul so rebellious and proud as mine, that he should extend his great love unto such as I. The magnificent and incomprehensible effect of the atonement of Jesus Christ is based on God's love for each of us. It affirms his declaration that the worth of souls, every one, is great in the sight of God. In the Bible, Jesus Christ explained this in terms of our Heavenly Father's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In modern revelation, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, declared that He so loved the world that He gave His own life that as many as would believe might become the sons of God. Is it any wonder then that the Book of Mormon, another testament of Christ, concludes with the teaching that to become perfect and sanctified in Christ we must love God with all our might, mind, and strength. His plan, motivated by love, must be received with love. What else has our Savior Jesus Christ done for us? Through the teachings of His prophets and through His personal ministry, Jesus taught us the plan of salvation. This plan includes the creation, the purpose of life, the necessity of opposition, and the gift of agency. He also taught us the commandments and covenants we must obey and the ordinances we must experience to take us back to our heavenly parents. In the Bible, we read his teaching, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And in modern Revelation, we read, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, a light which cannot be hid in darkness. If we follow his teachings, he lights our path in this life and assures our destiny in the next. Because he loves us, he challenges us to focus on him instead of the things of this mortal world. In his great sermon on the bread of life, Jesus taught, that we should not be among those who are most attracted to the things of the world, the things that sustain life on earth but give no nourishment toward eternal life. As Jesus invited us again and again, follow me. Finally, the Book of Mormon teaches that as part of his atonement, Jesus Christ suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, and this that the word might be fulfilled, which saith he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. Why did our Savior suffer these mortal challenges of every kind? Alma explained, and he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh that he may know, according to the flesh, how to succor, which means to give relief or aid, to his people according to their infirmities. Our Savior feels and knows our temptations, our struggles, our heartaches, and our suffering, for he willingly experienced them all as part of his atonement. Other scriptures affirm this. The New Testament declares, in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Isaiah teaches, 
Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. All who suffer any kind of mortal infirmity should remember that our Savior experienced that kind of pain also, and that through his atonement, he offers each of us the strength to bear it. The Prophet Joseph Smith summarized all of this in our third article of faith. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. What has Jesus Christ done for me, that sister asked? Under the plan of our Heavenly Father, He created the heavens and the earth so that each of us could have the mortal experience necessary to seek our divine destiny. As part of the Father's plan, the resurrection of Jesus Christ overcame death to assure each of us immortality. Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice gives each of us the opportunity to repent of our sins and return clean to our heavenly home. His commandments and covenants show us the way, and His priesthood gives the authority to perform the ordinances that are essential to reach that destiny. And our Savior willingly experienced all mortal pains and infirmities that He would know how to strengthen us in our afflictions. Jesus Christ did all of this because He loves all of the children of God. Love is the motivation for it all, and it was so from the very beginning. God has told us in modern revelation that He created male and female after His own image, and He gave unto them commandments that they should love and serve Him. I testify of all of this and pray that we will all remember what our Savior has done for each of us and that we all will love and serve Him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. How has Jesus Christ prepared a way for each of us? Knowing that He has overcome all things for you, what do you feel impressed to go and do? See also Gospel Topics Obedience in the Gospel Library. Parents recognize the importance of teaching small children to avoid touching a hot stove or running into the street in front of cars. If children obey, whether or not they understand why obedience is necessary, they will enjoy greater safety and protection. In our pre-mortal life, the Lord declared that providing God's children with a mortal experience on earth was necessary to prove them to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. God desires that we each learn to follow Him and obey His commandments. When we do so, we will receive the blessing of living with Him in a state of never-ending happiness. By using our moral agency and the guidance of the Spirit, we can begin to see why God has given us laws to obey. Heavenly Father promises happiness and blessings to all who will heed His words and willingly observe His commandments. What is Obedience? In the Gospel of Jesus Christ, obedience is understood as doing God's will and keeping His commandments. It includes exercising our agency or freedom of choice to follow God with a willing heart. We demonstrate our love for God when we choose to trust and submit to His will. Section 1. Jesus Christ obeyed God the Father in all things. Jesus Christ declared, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. Throughout His mortal life, Jesus demonstrated obedience to all His Father's laws and commandments. He said, I do always those things that please Him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Father, if Thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but Thine be done. After suffering in Gethsemane, He humbly submitted to His Father's will and was crucified, making Himself an offering to redeem all of us. Because Jesus Christ was obedient to His Father in all things, he made salvation and exaltation possible for God's children. In our day, the Lord asks us to follow in His footsteps 
and live by every word which proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. Jesus Christ clarified the most important reason for us to obey God when he issues the direct and simple invitation, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Jesus Christ lived a sinless and holy life. He invites us to follow him. Read 2 Nephi 31, 7-10. Know ye not that he was holy? But notwithstanding, he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father, and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. And again it showed unto the children of men the straightness of the path, and the narrowness of the gate, by which they should enter, he having set the example before them. And he said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? What is required for those who desire to follow Jesus Christ? God declared that his work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Read Doctrine and Covenants 11.20 and consider what the Lord identifies as your work. Behold, this is your work to keep my commandments, yea, with all your might, mind, and strength. Elder Robert D. Hales taught, Because our Savior was obedient, he atoned for our sins, making possible our resurrection and preparing the way for us to return to our Heavenly Father. Discuss what blessings we enjoy because Jesus Christ was perfectly obedient to God the Father. What would God have us do to show our gratitude for the many blessings we receive? Section 2. Your obedience to God will lead to happiness and blessings. We learn in the Book of Mormon that all who heard King Benjamin's significant sermon were deeply converted to Jesus Christ. As a result, they expressed a willingness to covenant to keep God's commandments. One of the responsibilities members of Christ's church have in our day is to keep all of God's commandments. The prophet Joseph Smith explained how important this duty was to him when he said, I made this my rule, when the Lord commands, do it. Our loving Heavenly Father has revealed the eternal principle that governs how blessings are given. When we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. There are various reasons we might choose to obey God's commandments. At times we may do so out of fear or punishment. Sometimes we might simply be seeking the promised reward. But the most important reason to be obedient is that we love Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and want to serve them. God requireth the heart and a willing mind. Think about all the ways Heavenly Father has demonstrated His love for you. Read Mosiah 2, 20-24. I say unto you, my brethren, that if you shall render all the thanks and praise which your whole soul has power to possess, to that God who has created you, and has kept and preserved you, and has caused that ye should rejoice, and has granted that ye should live in peace one with another, I say unto you that if ye should serve Him who has created you from the beginning, and is preserving you from day to day by lending you breath, that ye may live and move and do according to your own will, and even supporting you from one moment to another. I say, if ye should serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants. And behold, all that he requires of you is to keep his commandments, and he has promised that if ye would keep his commandments, ye should prosper in the land, and he never doth vary from that which he hath said. Therefore, if ye do keep his commandments, he doth bless you and prosper you. And now, in the first place, he hath created you and granted unto you your lives, for which ye are indebted unto him. And secondly, he doth require that ye should do all he hath commanded you, for which if ye do, he doth immediately bless you. And therefore, he hath paid you, and ye are still indebted unto him, and are and will be for ever and ever. Therefore, of what hath ye to boast? Why is our obedience all that God requires of us? Now read Mosiah 2.41 And moreover I would desire that ye should consider all the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God, for behold they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual, and if they hold out faithful to the end, 
they are received into heaven, that thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember these things are true, for the Lord God has spoken it. How might you describe to another person how generous God is to those who sincerely seek to obey his commandments? Lehi's family experienced great difficulties as they traveled in the wilderness for several years. Because they sought to keep God's commandments, the Lord blessed them. Read 1 Nephi 17, 1-4. And it came to pass that we did again take our journey in the wilderness, and we did travel nearly eastward from that time forth. And we did travel and wade through much affliction in the wilderness, and our women did bear children in the wilderness. And so great were the blessings of the Lord upon us, that while we did live upon raw meat in the wilderness, our women did give plenty of suck for their children, and were strong, yea, even like unto the men. And they began to bear their journeys without murmurings. And thus we see that the commandments of God must be fulfilled. And if it so be that the children of men keep the commandments of God, he doth nourish them and strengthen them and provide means whereby they can accomplish the thing which he has commanded them. Wherefore, he did provide means for us while we did sojourn in the wilderness. And we did sojourn for the space of many years, yea, even eight years in the wilderness. According to verse 3, what is God prepared to do for those who keep his commandments? We will not always understand why God has given certain commandments. Yet when we exercise our agency and choose to trust and obey God, we can be confident that everything will work for our good. The Savior promised us, If you keep my commandments and endure to the end, you shall have eternal life, which gift is the greatest of all the gifts of God. President Ezra Taft Benson declared, When we put God first, all other things fall into their proper place or drop out of our lives. What does it mean to you to put God first? Ask group members to talk about times when they have seen that all other things fall into their proper place or drop out of their lives when we put God first. Use stories and examples to teach gospel principles. As you prepare to teach, think of personal experiences that could add a second witness to the accounts in the scriptures. For example, when has the Lord prepared a way for you to do his will? 1 Nephi 3, 8, And it came to pass that when my father had heard these words, he was exceedingly glad, for he knew that I had been blessed of the Lord. Yes, Nephi, come in. Come in, sit with me. The Lord hath commanded me that thou and thy brethren shall return to Jerusalem. Laban hath the record of the Jews, and also a genealogy of my forefathers, and they are engraven upon plates of brass. Thou and thy brother should go unto the house of Laban and seek the records, and bring them down hither into the wilderness. I suppose Laban and Lemuel have refused? They murmur, saying it is a hard thing which I have required of them, but I have not required it of them. But it is a commandment of the Lord. I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. Thou hast been blessed of the Lord.
Lehi fulfilled the callings he received from the Lord. He declared unto the people the things the Lord commanded him to declare, took his family and departed into the wilderness, and had his sons return to Jerusalem for the plates. Why do you think Lehi was so diligent in completing his assignments from the Lord? How might you better fulfill your callings?